Hello, DEC Young Leaders, and welcome to what I'm certain will be another outstanding virtual Young Leader meeting. I'm Steve Gregorian, CEO of the Detroit Economic Club, and happy Thursday to you all. For today, we're going to spend some time together where, like all Young Leader meetings, we can learn from a successful executive and grow our DEC member networks. We'll spend 30 minutes with our guest today, and then we invite you to stay for an optional 15-minute networking session. For today, we do want to see your smiling faces, so have your videos on, but please mute your mic. If you would like to ask a question throughout the session, please use the chat box. Let me know you've got a question, and we'll try our best to work those in. So let's get started. Our guest today is David Fulton, who is chairman of the board and CEO of Honigman. David received his undergrad and JD both from the University of Michigan, Go Blue. He is a well-respected community leader and serves on boards such as the Downtown Detroit Partnership, the Detroit Regional Chamber. He chairs the United Way for Southeastern Michigan. And of course, David's a highly, highly valued board member of our very own Detroit Economic Club. So David, welcome. Thanks for your time and for always being so supportive of me and the Detroit Economic Club. Thank you. I'm just delighted to be here. I really am. All right, let's get uh, started, David. I've got to start by talking about two fun things that I learned about you recently while I was reading the latest Our Detroit Magazine. One, congratulations to your wife, Elise, who was named one of 2020's best dressed Detroiters. And two, You've got seven kids and two sets of twins. Well, that's true. And, you know, I, I would say the best career advice I could give anybody is get yourself a great partner. Um, having a great partner goes a long way in um, having a great career. And I have a great partner. And yes, we do have seven kids. Four are still at home, two sets of twins. And my partners often think that I come into the office to get a break, that I come into work. So it's a little easier on me being in, in the office than at home. I love it. David, the topic you chose today was doubling down on community leadership. We'll get to that in a minute, but let's start with your career path. So tell us about your career choice and your career progression. So um, I come from a small family, immediate family, a very large, greater family. And when I was five years old, my mom and dad uh, formed a family business. My 14 year old brother and I were the other two employees of the business. And that family business has sort of had a, a real profound impact on me growing up in a business like that. Uh, early on, as I started to grow in the business, I was sort of a smart aleck kid. Um, I talked back a lot, talk back to teachers. And my parents decided that, that that's some kind of a characteristic of a lawyer, either that or a felon. And so um, they encouraged me. And when I was a kid, I read two books, Kill a Mockingbird and Inherit the Wind. And it, it, they very much influenced me to want to go to law school. Um, I went to business school thinking that I would actually come back into the family business with my brother, who's nine years older than I am. Um, but I did well, and I decided that I'd go to law school at Michigan um, and did well, decided that I would give uh, interning with a law firm a try. My first year, I interned for a small um, personal injury firm. I made $5 an hour. And the second year, I started interviewing with law firms all around the country. Um, and... Um, I really had no intention of staying here. And, you know, it was a time to get away. There were a lot of glamorous firms in New York, LA, but my older brother really wanted me to stay near. And he convinced me to stay by telling me that if I moved, I would spend every vacation back here with my family. Whereas if I stayed here, I could spend every vacation in somewhere really, really nice and enjoy myself. So I stayed, I, I joined Honigman for the summer. I loved it. Um, I had, you know, I'm always been a, all the way back to the family business, a student of business. I always thought there were two kinds of businesses. One, you're on the offense and the other, you're on the defense. And you don't want to be in a business 
that's playing defense. You want to be in a business that's on the offense. And that's what Honigman was at the time. It was an upstart firm. Uh, it was not a silk stocking firm. It appealed to me. And I had a great year. I had a great, a great summer. In terms of progression, I wanted to be a trial lawyer. Um, I got to Honigman and they told me that I didn't want to be a trial lawyer, uh, that I wanted to be a business lawyer. I spent a year doing both. They were right. I made the decision to be a, a business lawyer and I have not regretted it once. So you're this young lawyer at Honigman. Did you have a goal of leading the firm at a later point? In your no, firm? you know, at the time, most of us had no intention of leaving. We had a pretty high turnover rate. I mean, it, it, you know, I didn't want to leave. And most of the time when Honigman was around, you lived in fear of leaving. He was a brutally honest, brilliant guy. And, um, you know, he would tell you what he thought. And then Miller would come back by with Honigman. Miller was sort of the heart and soul. And he'd say, and Jason was a little guy. I mean, he was a, looked like Mr. Magoo, but he was fierce. And Miller would say, you didn't really mean to tell that to David, did you? And you know, I'm gonna go, mm, probably not. And so, but I did, I really wanted to stay. It was my goal to, to make a career of it. Um, so you mentioned a couple of guys, who's had the largest impact on your career and what did you learn from him or her? So the largest impact on my career really was my dad. Um, my dad was the best business person, intuitive business person, that I'd ever met. He was smart. He was witty. My colleagues who are here and Fritz too, my partners are sick of me talking about my dad's isms because my father had an ism for everything. And we, we run a lot of what we do in the firm is stuff that my dad had told me. I mean, little things like he would say, so you want to motivate people. And I say, I really do want to motivate people. And he'd say, then go out and hire motivated people. And so we we live by a lot of those. So I'd say my dad, within the firm, I think that the two people who had the most impact, both were active with the economic club. Alan E. Schwartz, who was one of the three founders, we had a very, very close relationship. Um, he was a client. We worked closely together. And I can't begin to tell you how much I learned, particularly in terms of board interaction from Alan. And the other was the late David Page, who was a, a remarkable lawyer, and even more importantly, uh, remarkable in the community involvement. He was really one of the two or three people who launched the Riverfront Conservancy. And when you go up and down the river, that's David Page and a couple of others. And there's even a little garden there that's named after David. So I would say, and I've had many others in the firm, but those two were really the principal um, mentors. Great. Um, so we've already established you've got seven kids, busy family, and lots of folks on this call are juggling young families. How do you balance your work and family life? And has this evolved over your career? Well, it's, it's easier for me now. I mean, frankly, we're at a point in life where we could get lots of help. And, um, you know, so it was easier when I was growing up in the law, the world was different. Um, we were one income families. Um, we did not have two income families. And so when I had to stay late or I had to work or I had to go out of town, you know, I did it. I didn't have to balance uh, anything in that way. What I did with family was because I enjoyed it. I loved it. Um, but it's challenging. and we all know right now, it's an absolutely incredible challenge for people with small children, trying to teach them at home, you know, working at a, the home. We have a, many of our meetings, we'll see kids pop up. We'll see on Zoom, somebody will pop up, get in the way of the camera. And, you know, we try to be lighthearted about it, but I know that for the parent, it's, it's tough. We were kind of looking forward to seeing your two dogs jump in on your lap here. Not happening. <laughs> All right, let's uh, shift over and talk a bit about uh, your thoughts on leadership and, and lessons learned for a little bit. So everyone faces roadblocks in life, certainly. Talk about some of your professional challenges. How did you overcome them? And what lessons can you share with young leaders on the call today? Well, you know, most of us are very impatient with our careers. 
And one of the things that I overcame early was this impatience. I wanted to get everything right away. I wanted to grow into this level right away. And I learned later than I wish I had that careers are really a marathon. They're, they're not a sprint. And, you know, every choice you make is a choice that keeps the most options open for you. Uh, as I said, my biggest challenge was that Honigman was a wonderful place to work and um, great lawyers, but it was a demanding, demanding place. We, we had a lot of demands placed on us. David Page could be brutal. And then at four o'clock, he'd say, let's get dinner. I got tickets to the Pistons game and you'd have a wonderful night. But during the days there, they were very demanding and, you know, learning how to overcome the demands and the life is a, a long marathon. It was a big lesson for me. Um, let's talk about leadership. Um, in your opinion, what are some of the most important attributes of a leader? So um, interesting, I should probably for a second just say that um, leading a law firm or a service enterprise is a lot different than leading a lot of other businesses. It's not a command and control module. You, you, you don't, the CEO doesn't tell somebody, go do this or you're in trouble. You, you work, CEO of a law firm works for your partners. So I can't just go to a partner and, and say to the partner, this is what you're gonna do. Um, you have to build up a consensus. You have to have the trust of people. But, but I think other than that, there are a number of things that are common, I think, for leaders. The, the first is um, integrity. You, you have to be honest. You have to be um, you know, honest with people. And that's not always easy. It's very hard to give people bad news. It's very hard to be straight with people. It's very hard to say, you're not doing a good job with this, or we need you to do something different. And um, you can't lead a business unless you're truthful with everybody about what can be done better and what can't. Judgment is incredibly important. Um, good judgment is something that can't be taught, um, but it's, it's critically important. You need vision. You need to know where that business is going to go. You need to understand the business. You need to be able to drive change. Um, those of you who are on this call who are lawyers know, I'm going to make up numbers, but they're directionally right. Lawyers are about seven standard deviations off on resilience, which makes us completely resistant to change. And so you have to, to be able to drive change and to be strategic um, really is an important skill. I would say self-awareness is very, very important. You really have to be self-aware. You have to be thick-skinned. Um, you can't let people um, upset you or distract you. If someone heard something that you didn't intend to say, they heard it, and you got to deal with it. You can't get mad at them because they heard it wrong. You have to be able to listen. You really have to listen to people. I think Again, as a lawyer, what you learn is most people don't really listen. You're, you think about what you're going to say in response to the person who's talking. And you can't do that. You got you to listen and hear what they're saying and then pause and respond. A couple other things. There, there's a level of stubbornness to being a leader. Um, if you have an idea that you want to see fly, you got to listen to people and whatnot, but you have to stay with it. You've got to be stubborn about it. Um, there's a we and an I notion to being a lawyer. The, Jim Collins is a great author, wrote a great book called Good to Great that many of us have read. And if you haven't, read it. But it's a great study of leadership. And we succeed. I fail. So if an initiative fails, I fail. But where it succeeds, we, we succeed. And then I think the last two things are, and three, you need to be consistent. People do not like inconsistency in leadership. You have to love your colleagues. You have to love the business, to love your colleagues. It has to really be personal. You have to look at it and mean it, that it's a, that, that, that it's a family. Um, and the last is you're the face of your business. A leader is 
the face of the business everywhere. So when you kidded me, Steve, that Elise was an hour magazine, okay, well, that's the face of our business. Somebody might like it, somebody might not like it. Um, and when you're the face of a business, people listen to you. They, they hear what you say. They don't often hear it the way you intend it, and you have to be careful with that. And you really, you're giving hope to your colleagues. You're, you're not giving optimism. You're, you're giving hope. We just went through something, the real test of leadership that we're still in with the, the pandemic. And you need to give your people hope, not, not false optimism. And so I think those are the qualities of leadership. Let's keep going a little deeper on that. So I know it's important to you in your role at Honigman to develop, identify and develop some of your young leaders. Um, so what characteristics are you looking for? Do you find most valuable as you're looking to identify those young leaders with their professional development opportunities? It's a great question. And we're always looking for, for leaders at, at every, every level. I think the first few that I said, if, if you're not honest, you're not a leader. Okay, that, that's, you know, you have to be very, very good at your craft. Your colleagues will not respect you in a law firm as a leader unless they think you're a great lawyer. Not, not going to happen. And, and you do have people that are great business developers or whatever, but they're not admired for their skills. And if you're not admired for your skills, you won't. And you can see that growing up. Um, how well liked you are? How do you get along with your colleagues? Um, you know, what do they think of you? It's a, um, uh, the, uh, the biggest mistake I think we make with emerging leaders that we've learned over the years, it's sort of the Peter principle <clears throat> where you confuse someone who gets things done with someone who can lead. So we, got, we have people who get everything done they're supposed to get done. It's fantastic skill. But then you turn them loose as a leader and they're not a leader. They, they, they don't have to get other people to do what needs to be done. So we, we watch it, but the, I think at younger ages, the most critical things are good personality, uh, affection for their colleagues, integrity, and, and great skill at what they're doing. Let's talk about a little bit about your professional development. What training or activities not related to your profession have been most important to your success and why? Well, one of them is right here. I think community activity and community involvement is really, really critical um, to career growth. You learn so much. I mean, you know, in the 15 minute networking you're gonna have together, you learn so much from others. I can't begin to tell you, I don't leave a Detroit Economic Club board meeting without having learned two or three things. And I don't, and, and they come right back to how we run the law firm. There's always something Steve does in a meeting or uh, Jerry Anderson or in any other board, there's always something that goes on that lights off on a high moment. And, and, and this kind of activity, this is really true diversity. I mean, you get people from foundations, you get people from corporations, you get people from labor, and everybody sort of seems to leave at the door all of their issues and just focuses on one. So I, I would have to tell you maybe the most important thing outside of business that's been helpful to me is community involvement. And maybe the second would be um, clients. Uh, we have clients who've taught me a lot of positives about leadership. I have some great recollections of clients who are great leaders. I have recollection of terrible leaders. You can, you can, you know, you can learn from the other side as well. And my family, I think, you know, coming home to my family and, and, and dealing with family stuff over these years also is, is quite impactful and friendships. Your, your friendships teach you. you, you know, you admire your friends, you see how they handle situations. One of the things about lawyers uh, we get to see the very best of people and the very worst of people. We, we see people when they're in their worst moments and we can see the level of character that they deliver in a bad moment. And you learn a lot from that. You, you learn, you know, somebody has a chance to cut a corner um, and you, you learn 
what it feels like to not cut the corner. Thank you, David. I want to remind people on the call that we're, uh, David's very willing to take some questions. If you've got a question, just tell me in the chat room. I've got a question and we'll work it in. So in the last 10 minutes. It looks um, like you have four chats. I don't know what that, I just see that I see four oh, in the chat. Yeah, those were, um, looks like Christina, just uh, reminding people about some of the important points that you okay. said. Okay, good. So let's talk about community engagement. Um, why has community involvement played such an important part of your life? And what are the most important lessons you've learned from your involvement? You started to talk about that. Let's dig a little deeper. Well, it makes me happy. Um, it, it, it really gives me great pleasure. Um, you know, all of us have been, you're on this phone, we're privileged. Everybody on this phone call is privileged with something. And we've got so much and we're blessed compared to others that it just pleases me to, you know, use my talent and treasure to help others and be involved with others. And it's fun. Um, I always enjoy, as I said, I enjoy these board meetings. I enjoy um, the, the, the civility and involvement. Our firm has a great history of community involvement. I, I can't sit here in the last 10 minutes and not um, talk about that for a bit. It's in our DNA. I mean, Alan Schwartz, David Page, we're all over the community. They, they were leaders at the DEC, they were leaders at the United Way, they both preceded me as chairs there. Uh, one of our proudest moments in my 40 years with the firm is that uh, my partner, Alan S. Schwartz, who's not related to Alan E. Schwartz, and his team led the DIA through the bankruptcy, led, it, led, led them into the grand bargain, they saved the art. And that was a proud moment for us. We were probably, probably could have been engaged in that bankruptcy in any number of much more uh, lucrative aspects of the bankruptcy. But we, we stayed with a 40 year client, the DIA. And I, I'll never forget when the um, party, the grand reopening party took place, um, Jean Gargaro thanked the law firm. And um, so there's, there's a real, DNA that we have, and those of you from the firm who are on the phone know it. We encourage leadership at, at, at early levels. And so I just enjoy it. I know it's important, Hadigman. Can, can you tell us about some of the innovative programs that you've gotten your firm involved in? We have a couple that we're very proud of. Um, we, we have really an urgent diversity, inclusion, and equity initiative. And um, we've concluded a long time ago that at least in our business, um, it doesn't start in college or law school. It's, it's too late. So we have, uh, Fritz, what do we have? 80, 90 people that participate in TutorMate, uh, where once a week we read to a third grader. Um, and then we have a graduation at the end of it. We have through the United Way with DPS, a Honigman Academy. We take 15 or 20 um, juniors and sophomores from Cody High. Uh, it's a rigorous application process and we have a curriculum. We, we bring them, brought them, now we're doing it virtually, but we bring them down to the office. They learn the business of law. They don't just learn, it's not a show and tell, they learn what a marketing department is, they learn what um, tech department is. And the notion there is a laddered learning. A lot of these kids are not gonna go to the colleges that, that we went to, that's just a fact. A lot of these kids, if they're lucky, they'll be in a two year school. Well, if we can get them in a two year academy and understand that they can get a job in the law and get the rush of being in a law firm and understand what that is, that's a huge head start. Somebody like that can go to law school at night while they have a career. So we're very, very proud of the academy. Uh, those are just two examples. We have just now, there's a brand new STEM based, uh, it's been in medicine for years, it's called Thrive. We just now are sponsoring two kids. You sponsor two 10th graders, one each. You pay for them for 10 years for intense STEM work after school during the summer. Uh, and you mentor them, there's almost no possibility that they'll come back to us. But the statistics of these kids in medicine 
getting into major schools and research. So those are a couple of examples of what we do as an institution. Those are amazing. And, and you not only talk the talk, you walk the walk. So congratulations. Um, we've just got a few minutes left. What advice do you have for the young leaders on this call in terms of being engaged in, in their volunteerism? Well, I think one thing is don't do it for your career. If you, if you do this for the career, you'll stink. You'll be terrible at it. And what will end up happening is that you'll create negative views of yourself. You, you, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, you got to enjoy it. Find something that you enjoy and do it because you enjoy it. Uh, that's the most important thing of, of all. Um, and and it's, it's fine if you don't enjoy it. I mean, don't do it. Write a check. To, you, you know, find some way. But if you, if you enjoy it, do it. Um, be patient. Uh, one of the great things about Detroit really is it doesn't take long to become very important in an organization. I mean, you know, we have folks on the DIA, but the symphony board, you know, if you're in New York, none of us is going to be on the symphony board. Not, none of us is going to be on the, the economic club board. And so there's so many opportunities here to make a name for yourself and an impact at a young age. And so I would just pick what you like and have fun with it. We did get, David, a, a question in the chat room, which I think is a good one to sort of wind down. Um, you do amazing things for your firm and the community. What do you hope, David Fulton, uh, what do you hope your legacy will be in the community? Good guy. Good guy. Uh, you, you're clearly there. Um, so <laughs> we actually, yeah, we actually got time for, let's end on this. You, you are the leader of Honigman, a major law firm, a large nonprofit you chair, United Way for Southeast Michigan. Um, tell us about some similar, similarities and difference in, in those roles and how do you balance your time between all of those? It's a, it's a great question. Um, a nonprofit is very different than, than a profit, um, for-profit business. First of all, you're bringing all walks of life into the room. Um, Democrat, Republican, you know, conservative, liberal, um, white, black, um, you're, you're, you're just balancing with one simple common interest and you learn so much from that. I mean, you, you, you really do. Um, the balance, you gotta like them both. You gotta really enjoy it. You have to have a partner who wants you to be active, who wants the time. You have to have a, a patient family. But the other real, the, the, and, and it's a, the person who works at a nonprofit is different than a person who works in a for-profit. They, they, they really care. They're more selfless. They, they, they're more humble. You know, it's, we at, in the for-profit world, we take credit for everything. We take credit for what we did. We take credit for what you did. In a nonprofit world, it's a much more humble world than that. Um, but I think the most important thing, it's, um, it's humbling. I mean, it, it, at United Way, for example, we deal with people in the most undignified circumstances, completely undignified circumstances, and we treat them like customers. Um, we treat them with the most dignity that you can. We've served 17 million meals since March. Um, you know, not the, our, our clients don't get DoorDash. Uh, we've done 17 million meals and we've done it with just as much dignity as you get when you go to the Coney to pick something up, Fritz, or when you go to the fanciest restaurant around. And there's something really, really gratifying about being around something like that and, and being part of that. Well, David, our time is up. I said we would uh, just keep you for 30 minutes. I can't thank you enough for the thoughtful conversation. And again, thanks for all you do for me and my role at the DEC and for all you do at the Detroit Economic Club. Thank you for everything you do and thank you all for letting me join you. Good luck to all of you, stay safe and well, bye-bye. Thank you, David, talk soon. I also wanna thank Fritz and Tony from your team and to my team for their work on today's session.